Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, John Quelch, Dean of the University of Miami, Patty and Alan Herbert Business School at the University of Miami. And uh, it's my pleasure this evening to uh, welcome you to this Distinguished Leaders uh, uh, fireside chat uh, with uh, Lisa lutoff Perlo. Uh, Lisa uh, is uh, the first uh, woman uh, to be leading one of Royal Caribbean Group's cruise line brand. She's the president and CEO of Celebrity Cruises and uh, has had a very distinguished uh, career with uh, Royal Caribbean, having started there as a marketing uh, manager, uh, really in selling. Uh, and I think uh, uh, when you uh, uh, enjoy the next hour with Lisa, you'll know that she's still a salesperson at heart. So well, welcome, Lisa. It's very good to have you with us this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean. Once a salesperson, always a salesperson. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And uh, let, let, let me, let me uh, start there by uh, asking you, you know, as a CEO, what's the value of having started as a salesperson? Uh, well, not only did I start as a salesperson, I really started at the very bottom. And over a course of 30 years, um, I navigated my way, pardon the pun, I know, I know I'm in the cruise <laughs> business. Um, I navigated my way through the sales organization and then into marketing, then into operations. And, uh, you know, I worked on multiple brands within our company. And so certainly all of that experience is very helpful. But um, back to the question of what's it, you know, is it helpful to be a salesperson? Absolutely. I have found in my life and in my career, you're always selling. You're selling an idea. You're, um, you know, you're, you're selling your team. You're inspiring. You know, you're, you're presenting something and hoping everyone will come along and buy in, if you will. And so I, I really believe that my background in sales has been extraordinary, extraordinarily helpful to me in my career, for sure. Right. And, um, just perhaps uh, say a little bit about celebrity because uh, we're all familiar with Royal Caribbean uh, and many people on the uh, webinar, I'm sure, will have uh, been on uh, one of the cruises of uh, Royal Caribbean, but maybe not necessarily celebrity. So there's a house of brands, to use the Procter & Gamble terminology, uh, under the Royal Caribbean umbrella. Uh, so what does celebrity stand for that differentiates it from, uh, say, a Royal Caribbean uh, experience? Um, well, Royal Caribbean is very focused on families, um, young children, water slides. They, I would say that Royal Caribbean really positions themselves as a competitor of Disney, not, not just the cruise line, but the parks as well. Families looking for that type of an adventurous vacation for young children. Celebrity is more of a global brand. Um, we are, our ships are smaller than the Royal Caribbean ships. They're not small, but they're smaller than Royal Caribbean ships are. I, I always refer to the size of our ships as medium size. Uh, they hold about 3000 people and they're more um, what we call new luxury. They're, um, you know, we focus on great food, great service, great spas, great wine list, um, and taking our guests a great design and really delivering the destination in a meaningful way that people that sail with us are, are very open to exploring the world in different cultures. Um, and that's, uh, that's how we position our brand as more of an upper premium brand and Royal is more of a contemporary adventurous brand. Uh, so how... In terms of the various uh, attributes of a cruise ship uh, brand, um, your target customers, what, what do they look for first, second, and third uh, when they're uh, considering uh, where to go and who to go with? Well, I think most people, when they're choosing a vacation, the first thing they decide is, where do I want to go? You know, what part of the world am I interested in seeing? Um, that's the first decision point. And then the second decision point is, how do I want to get there? You know, how, what kind of an experience do I want? And we oftentimes um, are hoping that people will think about a cruise, even if they haven't uh, initially thought of a cruise, it might not be the first thing that pops into their head. So our, um, you know, our, our positioning is that 
people think they know what a cruise is, but they don't really understand what a celebrity cruise is. And, you know, if, if we think about the, the segment of the market that we're after, we're after a more of a Gen X, 40 to 55, that's sort of our sweet spot. But of course our ages are up and down from there. And we're looking for people who really wanna sail um, in a way where they appreciate the finer things in life, I think is what I would say about celebrity. So, so that's the type of mindset we're looking for as, as well as being globally and culturally aware and wanting to explore. And then of course, it, they have to think about the brand that best fits what they're looking for and the type of experience that they're looking for. So, you know, they, they make a decision on where they want to go. They, they take a look at sort of the physical place they want to stay. And then they think about what are the experiences that are offered? Um, and is that the right, right place for me? What, what about the ships themselves? Because obviously uh, celebrity like Royal Caribbean more broadly has invested uh, enormously in uh, new vessels and actually continued to do so throughout uh, the COVID period. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the, uh, first of all, the celebrity edge and then apex and then uh, celebrity beyond, which I think uh, you just received from a French shipyard you know, what, what's different about these uh, vessels compared to those that preceded them? Well, every time a brand, uh, in our company anyway, you know, innovation is really key for us. And I know that that's a focus of what you all learn and teach at, um, you know, at the Herbert uh, Business School. And when we think about the different series of ships, and you mentioned the Edge, the Apex, and our brand new Celebrity Beyond, which we just introduced in Europe last year, it's our newest series of ships. And it really epitomizes what we you know, have been thinking about for Celebrity and how we really wanted to catapult the brand forward and really improve the experience and how people perceive our brand. Um, and we have, you know, we couldn't have been happier with Edge and Apex. They've both been named as Time Magazine's top 100 places in the world to visit. And Celebrity Beyond is even more spectacular than, than her sisters as she's come out. She's a little longer and, and taller. So we've e even improved the design and the experiences that we're able to offer our guests. And so these ships were really meant to elevate um, and change and repositioning Celebrity. Um, and that's how, that's how we thought about them as we were designing and building them. Is uh, sustainability important? Sustainability is extremely important. And I, I also know it's one of the things that's, um, again, very important, the, one of the focus areas of yours as well and all business all, all over the world. Actually, every ship that comes out is more um, environmentally friendly and more fuel efficient than the previous. So for example, Edge was 20% more efficient than the ship before her, Apex 20% more efficient than Edge and Beyond is 20% more efficient than um, even Celebrity Apex. And the entire industry is looking for ways to um, burn different fuels, alternative fuels. We're, we're looking at what's going to be available globally because we sail globally and we need to fuel our ships globally. We need engine builders to be able to be, build large enough engines for our ships to burn these alternative fuels. And, uh, and we're looking at that toward the future. But there are, you know, I encourage anybody that's listening to go online and look at our corporate sustainability report, but we are, we're heavily focused on ESG. We're heavily focused on sustainability. We have so many systems on board that um, are purifying, recycling, um, you know, weight, whether it's waste, whether it's carbon, um, everything on board is recycled. Pretty much nothing is offloaded from the ships at all. And when we introduced Celebrity Edge, we introduced her with a reduction of 90% of the guest single-use plastics. And we've done that across our entire fleet of ships. So um, uh, we, we have over 2,000 sustainable shore excursions in all of the places that we visit. And, uh, and we also have positive impact tours on Celebrity uh, so we are we're very very focused on sustainability. Yes. Yeah. Could you could you just say a few more words, Lisa, about how you work with uh, the ports of call, uh, often in uh, 
uh, emerging economies, I'm thinking in the Caribbean, for example, you know, how you help uh, those economies, not just directly with the expenditure of uh, uh, the passengers or the purchase of fuel locally, but other ways in which you impact the local economy positively. Well, you know, we provision in all of the ports that we visit around the world. So not only do our guests go into the ports um, and visit different businesses, uh, we, you know, when I mentioned the positive impact tours for celebrity, we take our guests deeper into the communities. We, we look for small businesses and business owners, minority business owners, women business owners, so that we can leave places better than we found them. Um, we plant trees in different destinations. You know, the, the Galapagos is a big, de big destination for celebrity. We built the first um, ship specifically built for the fragile ecosystem uh, in the Galapagos. And we also have a tree planting program with all of our guests uh, to, uh, to replant uh, the, the rainforest there. We, um, you know, we also, I think a lot of people know that many of our partners, especially in the Caribbean, are terribly impacted by hurricanes and storms and disasters, earthquakes that happen all over the world in the places that we visit. And we very much uh, support those economies and people and bring provision and supplies um, so that we are always looking to contribute in very different and meaningful ways as an industry that really no other industry does. Uh, can we talk about sustainable human capital for a moment? And perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what Royal Caribbean and Celebrity did regarding uh, the crew of all of your uh, vessels during the COVID period. Yeah, you know, people always ask me, ask me, what is the, what's the best thing about being back in business? And I always say, you know, hand on heart, it's bringing our crew back to work because they were so um, severely impacted when we, when our industry had to shut down. And many of them were out of work for up to two years, but we established um, a, a Royal Caribbean Cares program for our crew all over the world who were uh, experiencing death in their family due to COVID, losing their home due to COVID or, or not being able to uh, make a living while they were, you know, while they were out of work, while we were shut down. Um, and we contributed millions and millions and millions of dollars to that fund to help our crew get through until we, until we came back into service. And uh, can you talk a little bit about your own initiatives around uh, uh, women, uh, especially women on the bridge? Because I think this is just so important, a, uh, it's a manifestation of your own uh, leadership priorities as well. Yeah, um, you know, diversity and inclusion is really important to, first of all, me personally, but also our brand, um, our company, but specifically our brand. Uh, when you introduced me, Dean, you, you talked about the fact that I'm the first woman that has run one of the brands in our company. And I remember thinking about that back in late 2014 when I was appointed to this role. And one of the things that I realized, not so much on the sales and marketing side of my career, but on the operational side of my career, um, we were woefully um, imbalanced as it related to gender and specifically on the ships and specifically in the bridges. Uh, only 2% of the mariners in the world are women. When I first came to Celebrity, 3% of our bridge teams were women. And I made, it, uh, I made it a focus and I made it a priority. And now I'm happy to say seven years later, 32% of the women um, on our bridges, 32% uh, of the crew on our bridges are women. So we've made tremendous progress in that regard. Um, we hired the first and still only American woman as captain and she's uh, Captain Kate McHugh, May, maybe many in your audience follow her. She's got over 3 million followers on social media. Um, and she just took out the Celebrity Beyond. Uh, so she's she's been a, a wonderful addition and a great recruiter for us of other women navigators around the world. Uh, but we also uh, worked for one year to get the uh, International Maritime Academy to recognize 
the Ghana Maritime Institute, and we were the first cruise line to ever hire um, African people of color, women of color on our bridges. And, uh, and we were the brand that was the catalyst to getting the IMO to approve that Maritime Academy. So um, yeah, so we're very focused on diversity, not only gender, but also uh, people of color. Uh, let, let's just go back to uh, COVID for a moment. We talked about uh, employee uh, challenges during COVID. Um, just talk, talk us through the uh, customer related challenges, the uh, health and safety protocol debates that uh, I'm sure you were very much involved in for a couple of years. And, uh, you know, tell us how uh, you think uh, uh, the customer today is responding to your new and improved and, you know, massively upgrade, well, I would say not massively, but certainly upgraded safety protocols from pre-COVID. Well, I think the good thing about our, our company, Dean, is we've always uh, really gone above and beyond in everything that we've done relative to the health, safety, sanitation, cleanliness of our ships and the environment we provide for our guests. And certainly all of us um, in this during COVID and having all of the discussions on how we got back into business, upped our game even further. And, and those things will never go away just in terms of how we sanitize and the focus um, and the additional things that we've done. And um, I, I do believe that, you know, we have, you know, we, we are voluntarily following the conditional uh, con sale order from the CDC. So we sail with an extremely high percentage of our guests vaccinated. Uh, uh, all of our crew is vaccinated and boosted. Um, so we we've expanded our hospitals in the in the uh, in the and we did that during the worst of times of COVID. You know, one of the things that's certainly happened as this pandemic has gone on, hospitalizations are quite low, and people who are vaccinated and boosted are are really not uh, getting as sick as they were in the past. And so a lot of those things are organically and naturally changing. I think in terms of of the customer, one of the things that I've noticed when I've been on the ships is number one, they appreciate everything we're doing, but they also appreciate everything we've always done. And the second thing is they just want to live their lives. They just want to um, vacation. They want to feel safe, but they also want to get on with their lives. Um, and so they appreciate the fact that we're providing as safe and healthy as an, an environment as you'll find anywhere in the world. Actually, I don't think you'll find a healthier or, or safer environment anywhere than on a ship right now, based on what the industry has done as it relates to uh, coming out of this the world of COVID. Uh, do you uh, run buffet lines on Celebrity or is it all uh, table service uh, given COVID? We have marketplaces, you know, they're, 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 um, you know, they're like, but not really like buffets. They're, you know, they're beautiful food stations of different foods all over the world, but our, our crew does serve our guests. And that, that is something that we actually like. We think it's a better level of service than guests serving themselves. And since we're a new luxury cruise line, we think it's a better way to serve our guests. So that won't go away. Um, I think we've, we like that. So we're going to keep that. Um, and I'm, I, I'm assuming that other lines will go back to letting guests serve themselves uh, at some point in time. What, what did you learn as a leader during COVID? Oh, my gosh. We could probably all write a book about what we learned being a leader during COVID. Um, I think I learned um, being a leader. I, I guess I needed to flex different muscles during COVID. You know, as a as the president and CEO of a of a brand within a public company, you know we have we have targets, we have shareholder value, we have cruises to sell, we're driving all the time, um, you know we're looking for results, we're you know we're we're pushing and uh, inspiring and motivating people every day to sell more and do more. And I think during COVID, when it all stopped, right, when our whole world stopped, and none of us could have ever imagined that. And our industry was 
hit harder than any other industry in the world. I know universities had to close down and students had to learn via via Zoom. And I, I know so many, I know the world was impacted, but our business was completely shut down for a very long time, for 15 months. We had to borrow billions of dollars to stay in business. So when you have you know, your crew of 20,000 all over the world wondering when their jobs are going to come back, how they were going to stay safe, how they were going to make a living again. When you had your leadership team, um, you know, all sitting in some other location, you, none of us were together. and We were all, you know, and, and I had to um, just give everyone hope. And, uh, and I think that, you know, there were different muscles that I needed to flex. Empathy was certainly one of them. Um, you know, I, I dialed down the drive. I dialed down the pressure. We had nothing to sell. Uh, but I really had to keep people inspired and motivated and really believe that we were going to come out of this and we were going to be okay. And I think that that's what I learned as a leader. You know, you really have to give people hope as much as, as anything um, during, during really difficult times. Can you uh, share a couple of practices that uh, either you personally or the company adopted during COVID that are continuing after COVID uh, is uh, over? Uh, well, a, a very practical one is just sort of how we work. You know, we all, uh, we all were in the office every day and we were all working, you know, nine in the morning until six at night. Um, and we've, you know, we've relaxed that a bit. I think, you know, one of the things that I think about coming out of the COVID time is that there are so many things that are going to change forever. And I think how people want to work is one of the things that's going to change forever. And so we've gotten much more flexible in terms of, you know, we have a, a four day office week now, every, every Friday is work from home Friday. We offer two virtual weeks a year where our, our employees can work anywhere, in, anywhere they want. Um, we also have gone home based for a lot of the positions that were always in office buildings. So there are, uh, I would say the, the type of work and the expectation of being physically in um, uh, in our Port of Miami location or any office building location is one of the things that changed since COVID that I believe is going to remain. Okay. Um, you were born in Gloucester. Were uh, your parents uh, involved in uh, the uh, lobster fishing business or uh, in uh, fishing in general out of Gloucester, Massachusetts? That's almost compulsory, right? <laughs> well, it actually was. And I think we were one of the few families that wasn't, you know, I'm, I'm not Portuguese or Italian. And Gloucester is a very Portuguese and Italian fishing town. And I don't know, I, I, I'm hoping everybody saw Coda, because it was an amazingly wonderful movie filmed all in my hometown. And it was it was a family of, of fishermen. Um, and it was it brought back so many memories. But uh, no, interestingly enough, I grew up in this fishing town on the water, on the ocean, right? Gloucester's on the Atlantic Ocean. And my parents always owned restaurants. So I always found it really serendipitous that I ended up in the cruise business on the ocean in hospitality. So I don't know, somewhere those that little Gloucester world converged with my world now. And and it's a it's a strange but uh, but understandable connection. You uh, started out as a travel agent, right? I did, yes. Which again gives me a lot of understanding because so much of our business comes from our travel uh, partners, uh, agency partners. So it gives me a good understanding of how hard their job is as well. What, what uh, through all of the various roles at Royal Caribbean on the way up the uh, the ladder, can you pick out one or two that uh, really made a big difference, uh, where you learned the most, or you had a a tough experience uh, that shaped your future leadership uh, ability? So I would say that my role as the senior vice president of hotel operations for Celebrity, which was from 2007, maybe I was, I went into operations in 2005, but I became the head of operations in 2007. And I had that role through 2012. And I think that 
that position taught me the most, Dean. It really, it taught me to truly appreciate our crew and how hard they work and how important they are to the success of our, our, our brand and that they really are the heart and soul of our brand. And I, and I really started to understand um, fairness and gender equality because I came from sales and marketing and you never thought about that. It was never in your stream of consciousness. It was never in my stream of consciousness, but I realized there was such an inequity when I went into operations and that I really had an opportunity to change a culture and change um, and create opportunity for people who up until then and historically never had that opportunity. And then I also experienced my failures there. You know, I, I wasn't from operations, I was from sales and marketing. And so I was learning, I wasn't chosen for the role because of my subject matter expertise. I was chosen for the role because people believed I had high potential and that I was a good leader. Um, but at the end of the day, operations is, you know, you've got to, it's all buttoning up the details and it's having a really strong team of people around you. And I think I learned some lessons during that time that if you don't have a real, if you don't know everything you need to know based on the job you have, you really need a strong team of people around you because it's the only way you're going to be successful. You need to understand your gaps as a leader so that you can fill those in. Um, and so I learned, I learned a lot during that time. It made me um, a better, it made me a better leader. And it also helped me understand how to build a team. How do you choose who to have on your team? <clears throat> well, that's complicated, certainly, right? Depending on the team and the task at hand and really what your gaps are. But the first thing I do is I look to fill in my gaps. And I, know, I not only look, at, look to fill my own gaps, I look to fill the gaps of the team. So what are the strengths and what are the, what are the weaknesses and what is some of the, the, the different either styles or, or, again, subject matter expertise that you're trying to bring in. And I also look for balance on my team. And I'm not just talking about gender balance. Um, or, or diversity in terms of balance, but I'm also talking about experience balance. You know, I think it's really important to have people who know our business, who have been in our business for a while. And then I think it's important to just keep bringing in new people and new thinking so that you continue to evolve and grow your business. And you're not always so insular in how you're thinking about a problem or solving a problem, but you've got people who have experiences outside of our industry. I will be in, in our company in two days. I will celebrate my 37th year in the company. And, um, and so I, I know that I myself also need some external thinking and stimulation as I think through how to make sure that celebrity continues to be really successful uh, to not only today, but in the future. During your career, when someone offered you an opportunity, did you ever say no? Um, I never said no, but there were a couple of times I went kicking and screaming. And I, and I say that, I don't mean that literally, maybe figuratively, <laughs> but inside I was kicking and screaming um, because I also learned during my career, you really need to be open. You need to be open to trying new things and moving around and improving your experience um, so that you become more valuable, not only to the company that you're working for, but even yourself and what you want for your own future. And so what I realized in hindsight is when I went kicking and screaming, it was a mistake. I should have, I should have been cheering and thankful. Um, my first boss who did that, he moved me from sales to marketing. And I was devastated because I only wanted to ever be the head of sales. And so by him taking me out of sales after 17 years and moving me into marketing, he was basically telling me my dream was never going to be achieved. Um, and that was the first job I went into kicking and screaming, the first change, kicking and screaming. And when I see him now, because we're still good friends, even though he isn't in the company, he looks at me and says, how'd that work out for you? And so, uh, you know, I have to give credit where credit is due. He was right and I wasn't. Do you believe in mentoring? 
I, I do, but I, I even more believe in sponsoring. You know, I think in my career, I've always had a sponsor, somebody who actually cared about my success and cared about helping me get there. And I think, I think one of the things that's really important in your career is to find a sponsor and an advocate. Mentors are wonderful because I, I'm happy to mentor people. I'm happy to help them think through some of the things that they're trying to either accomplish or things they might need to do to get to a different place. But I, my, the favorite thing for me about what I do is paying it forward and sponsoring other people and being advocates for other people so that they can achieve their own dreams. And I believe as leaders, that is really the, the best thing that you can do because it gives me a tremendous amount of satisfaction. So I, I, um, I actually think sponsorship and advocacy is, is even more important than mentoring. There's, there's a uh, um, engaging story about how you uh, asked uh, for the CEO role uh, more than once. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> do, do, you, do you think you got it earlier or later than you would have if you hadn't asked? Earlier. I probably, I might have never gotten it had I not asked, but I will tell you another part of the story. The, the two men who vacated the positions that I asked for recommended me for the job. They uh, both were leaving, highly respected. They weren't leaving, uh, you know, in an acrimonious way. It was all wonderful. And, you know, they said uh, to Richard, who you know well, uh, Lisa is the person. You, you really need to give this job to Lisa. And he didn't, you know, until the third time that I asked. You know, they recommended me. I asked. He said no. Um, but I really do think if I didn't ask, I might never, never have gotten the position. And it's funny because, you know, I don't, I don't always think about, yeah, you know, maybe, I guess I, I guess, unlike maybe some other women who don't ask, I, I was, I asked and I asked the second time and I asked the third time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to give up and I wasn't going to let him keep telling me no. Um, and so I just, you know, and I, he always tells me that I was very elegant in how I responded to his no, but yet I was very clear in how I felt about it. And so I always, um, I always try to try to remain elegant while getting my point across. So, uh, so I think it would be really helpful at this point to, uh, have you sh share some advice in addition to this uh, for our, you know, particularly our women students who are on the webinar? You know, I'm sure they'd love to hear two or three ideas from you about how to advance their careers in an elegant but firm way. Yeah, uh, well, listen, I think that um, everybody has to do what feels right for them. But one thing I would encourage women to do is to step up and ask. Um, I think that, and I don't know why, and this isn't a criticism, it's just an observation because I see it every day where I am. Men are much more comfortable asking. And I think men are more confident in a lot of ways about their ability, even if you know, I think men will ask for a job when they're 60% ready and women won't ask until they think they're 100% ready. And, and, and that's why I say, you don't need to be 100% ready. You just need to know what you don't know. And I think that's the important thing. And then once you know what you don't know or admit what you don't know, and I think that's a mistake many professionals make, and maybe women because they... I don't know, you know, I, I hate to, I hate to quote all these things you read about women because I hate to stereotype, but you know, that imposter syndrome, right? Where women might not ask for help because they don't want people to think that they they don't quite deserve or they weren't quite, quite ready for the job. But I actually think asking for help is a sign of strength versus a sign of weakness. And I think when you ask for help, people feel invested in your success. And I've never in my career not asked for help. And every time I have, someone has given it to me and I've been very grateful for that. And they are very flattered by it. And they're very 
um, I think that they they feel really good that they they helped someone be successful. So ask for help. You don't have to be 100% ready. Understand your gaps and fill them in with, with strong team members um, who can make up for any deficiencies you feel you might have. You don't need to be a subject matter mm -hmm. expert to be a great leader um, and a great success. Uh, so I want to encourage our uh, webinar attendees to please send in uh, questions from Lisa. We're going to get to those in a, uh, a couple of minutes. But, uh, you know, here's an unusual one for you, uh, Lisa. Ruben and the Dark. Where did that come from for celebrity advertising? Which one? That's, that's, the, that's the, uh, uh, the singer on your What a Wonderful World um, Back oh, to the so, celebrity advertisement. So yes, what, what, so that what, was. What are you trying? What were you trying to do with that uh, TV ad, which I think probably a lot of people will uh, remember seeing in the last few months? Yeah, so that was when we were first first coming out of the pandemic, mm -hmm. and that was um, and that was part of our "Isn't It Time" campaign. And we were encouraging people to get back out and see the world because it's a wonderful world. And um, and we had all been locked up for too long, and that was the that was the reason. And we loved the remake, um, and so we chose we chose that song and we chose that campaign. I will tell you of all the campaigns that I've been involved with, um, that got an, an amazing that really struck an emotional chord, and it got a tremendous outpouring of of positive feedback uh, and. Um, and I just think it was the right spot for the right time. You know, we've moved away from it now. We're much yes. more celebratory. We're much more upbeat. But I think that was a perfect campaign at the time. Uh, if there was uh, one, one, one thing that you would uh, love to say to anyone traveling on a cruise um, that they should do or not do that would be really helpful to the operational performance of a cruise line, what is the one thing that they should do or not do? You mean the guests? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, gee, what should they do or not do that would be most helpful to the operation? Um, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't know what I could say to that. You know, I would say try everything. You know, I think one of the great things about cruising is that you get to explore and try so many different things, whether it's a new drink or it's a new dish or it's a new place to visit in the world. That's what I would say, uh, because I think it would just add to not only the experience, but it, it will enrich the vacation and enrich your life. And I think for me, that's the thing that I love most about cruising. And the other thing is, you know, that I love about cruising is you see the world by sea. And it's a beautiful way to travel. And it's the way the world was discovered. And so I would just say that you should really just take a moment and realize how you're exploring the world, just the way the explorers did. And there's no other way to do that than on a cruise ship. Are there certain regions of the world that lend themselves especially to uh, being seen by sea? I'm thinking, for example, of the uh, uh, Caribbean islands or the Greek islands or the uh, uh, fjords of Scandinavia. You know, th those would seem, or, or even Alaska. Alaska. Uh, I mean, yeah. that, that would seem to me to be much more readily accessible by sea in a week-long vacation or a two-week vacation. Yeah, but you know the uh, Galapagos? Let's not forget about the Galapagos. It's a wonderful way to see the Galapagos because you go island to island, and it's uh, and it's really exciting and wonderful, and you get to see all the flora and fauna, which is so great. But, you know, I've been in Asia, and I think Asia, it's wonderful to see Asia by sea. You're able to explore, and I'm not just talking about China. I'm talking about, you know, Thailand and, and Hong Kong and China and Vietnam and all of those great places. I did a cruise to India and uh, Dubai, the Middle East and India, um, the Spice Route, which was also so wonderful. Um, you know, again, I go back to seeing the world by sea is really special. You, when you cruise in and out of a port, it's, it's a perspective you're never going to get when you fly in and out of someplace. And, and, it's, um, 
it's just uh, it's it's just a great way to see the world. Um, in terms of, I'm just looking at some of the questions that are coming in now, and I'm just going to paraphrase a couple of them. But uh, could you talk about the um, competition in the industry? There, there are certain brands that have. Uh, come in relatively recently. I think most uh, people on the webinar will be familiar with Virgin, for example, entering this industry. I think uh, Ritz Carlton may also have uh, been talking about a cruise ship operation as well. Um, wh when you hear about this, um, do you uh, get worried or do you uh, just brush it off and say, gosh, there's so much to learn. These guys, you know, good luck, but they haven't got a hope. Uh, well, I actually, I actually look at it as a as a great opportunity for our industry. One of the things that has frustrated me for my thirty seven years is that people really don't understand cruising, and um, they there's there are a lot of misperceptions about cruising, even in twenty twenty two. And I started in nineteen eighty five. So um, I think that these types of brands coming into our industry, like Virgin and Ritz Carlton. I think it's good for our industry because people understand what those brands are and they understand that if they're entering the cruise industry, there's probably something worth thinking about in the cruise industry. So, so I do believe that it strengthens our industry and it strengthens the perception of the industry. So, um, so we look at these entrants as good for our industry, not, not uh, the other way around. Uh, so here, here's, a, here's an operational question for you. How, how can you reduce the waiting time for shore excursions? Um, <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, and I, I'm assuming the person who asked has been on a cruise and had to wait for their shore excursion. I'm not, I'm not sure why yeah. they're asking so that. I think they're, you know, waiting yeah. in the waiting in the waiting room for ages waiting to, in to the get waiting on room. the tender to go to the uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that we'll always, we always try to improve. We always look at the irritants to people. That obviously is one since someone asked the question. So we always look at um, how we can minimize the wait time and, um, and how we can expedite things in a much quicker way. I will say that tendering makes it a little more difficult um, just because we have to gather everyone before we take them off the, off the ship. Uh, but hopefully we will continue to... Um, to improve that timing. We can't eliminate it, but we certainly can improve it. Um, question, have, have the uh, healthcare facilities on all of the ships been upgraded post COVID? Um, our, our hospitals were expanded uh, just because we were required to expand them and we have extra equipment in there that we never used to have. Um, those will remain, those facilities will remain, that equipment will remain. I think the need for it um, is going to, you know, probably not be what we thought it was going to be, just because of how this has evolved and, um, and um, sort of diluted itself over time. So I'm not sure we'll ever get to a place, please God, where um, people are on ventilators. But those are on board and, and that that will all remain as 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 it was changed for our post-COVID world. And I think that's a good thing because then our facilities um, will be capable of offering more services for our guests if needed. Uh, have you been uh, subject to celebrity to the great resignation and how do you attract and retain young people today? Uh, how do you achieve uh, their loyalty um, similar to the loyalty that you have obviously shown for 37 years. <laughs> I don't know if that loyalty will ever happen again in, in our lifetime. But um, <laughs> but one thing that I will say, I don't know if, I, I won't call it the great resignation, but I don't think our company is immune to what's going on. You know, people moved to other places during COVID because we were all remote for a really long period of time. Again, we shut down for over 15 months. And then some of those people decided they didn't want to come back to Miami. We did go back to the office um, four days a week. Some people decided they didn't want to do that. Um, some people have moved on for different opportunities. Some people have decided to leave Florida. So, um, so I don't know if it's the great resignation, but we have suffered from resignations. 
And then when you suffer from resignations, I think we all know it's very, very difficult to find people now. The, the, the war um, on talent or for talent is, is real. You know, we're all looking to fill positions with highly qualified people. They're fewer and far between and people have so many choices now um, on where they want to live and where they want to work. So, um, so we continue to look for that and I encourage anybody who knows anybody that's either in school or graduating um, or looking for something to, to please uh, check out our website because we have a lot of great positions available and open. But you know, I think there's a lot of different factors that go into recruiting people and I do think culture is a big one. Um, I work with a lot of young people and I think the culture that we try to create within our company with our brand is something that attracts people and also keeps people. Compensation, benefits, remote working time, whether it's one day a week or two weeks, or uh, and then uh, two weeks a year where you can work anywhere you want. And then we also do pulse surveys every single month so we understand what's on our employees' minds and some of the things that we need to, um, to do to address some of the things that our employees are asking for. It's not easy though, I, I will say that. So one of our webinar attendees uh, started as a DJ on the Celebrity Eclipse and- uh, Really? <laughs> amazingly, amazingly is now a JD MBA student at the University I'm of Miami. Awesome, that is and, great. Uh, you know, I, I think being a DJ is a great training for becoming a JD. Um, <laughs> so, Having said that, you know, he's asking, I think, a very interesting question, which I'll um, paraphrase a little bit. How, how, do, how can someone like that uh, contribute to the industry? How, how, what would be a good um, set of starting position options uh, for him to re-enter the industry with, with that experiential background, but now with a JD MBA? Should he re-enter on the ground floor in operations or would he be better off uh, re-entering in a legal uh, capacity, for example? Yeah, you know, I mean, honestly, either or. I think I think the fact, um, I'm assuming it's a he, uh, yes. was, was, on, was on the ship, I think you said he. So, you know, the fact that one of the things that I think is really great experience is just understanding what the experience is all about and what the crew is all about and what, what the business is all about. And you don't get a better education in, um, in that regard other than being on the ship. So that's a wonderful perspective to have. But, you know, I think about our company. It is our company has so many different departments, shoreside, um, whether it's an operational uh whether it's marketing, whether it's sales, whether it's operations, whether it's legal. And I really think, again, you need to find the, your passion and, and what you really want to do and, um, and, and apply because I think that, and it doesn't even matter where you start, you know, and I'm living proof of that. Where, and, and, you know, where you start and where you end up are always two different things. And so I think that just getting in and uh, learning a different side of the business and the corporate side of the business would be really helpful at this point in time. Uh, when you interview people, what are the three things you're looking for? Attitude, culture, um, and passion. Mm -hmm. can, can you say a little bit more about the first two, how, how, how you would tease that out and evaluate it if you were interviewing someone? Um, well, the first thing, my, my interview process, I think is a bit unique because you know, first of all, I don't, I only interview for really top leadership positions. So I, I, I have a very narrow, um, very narrow interviewing uh, opportunities, just because fortunately, I, I'm not always in that situation where I have to find someone, but I also interview other high level candidates in the company. And how, you know, by the time someone gets to me, I don't look at their resume to see if they're qualified. I don't look, look at their experience to say, should they, you know, should I ask them about, you know, what they've done? I assume that's all been done before they come to see me. So my my interaction with candidates is, a, is more of a conversation. And I, I think that the way people answer the questions or engage in the conversation or share their points of view or thoughts 
help me understand if they're going to fit into the team. You know, you can tell if a person is self-centered. You know, I, I use sports analogies a lot. And for me, everything is about the team. It doesn't matter if you have one superstar on a team on a roster of 53 people, you're never going to win the Super Bowl. And so I'm, I'm not looking for that one person that wants all the attention. I'm looking for a person who really wants to be part of a team and who wants to help lift the team up, not just themselves. And you can you really can get a good understanding from conversations about how people answer the questions and, and what their first you know, what their priorities are. And I think that gives you a good sense of who they are as people. And, and so I, I try to ask questions that are unexpected um, and let the conversation just sort of naturally run its course. Okay. Um, here, here's, uh, here's another question. Um, have you, similar vein, um, have you made a significant hiring mistake? And if, if you did, what did you do about it? And what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, I've, um, I've hired quite a few people. And I'm sure I'm sure I've, you know, I've, I think I've, um, I've done well, but I've made mistakes. Um, what have I done about it? Well, the first thing is you have to admit you've made a mistake. That's, I think, the first thing that has to happen. Mm -hmm. And then you have to figure out how to have a conversation with a person that um, might be able to set them on, a, on the right course. But I, I don't think I've ever been successful once I realized I've made a mistake in turning someone around. Um, so I've done a couple things. You know, I think it's important, especially in a corporate environment, to give people enough time to prove that you're right or wrong about the fact that you made a mistake. And oftentimes, again, you shore up the team so that you can compensate for the things that you think that they're not doing well. But at the end of the day, um, after you've given someone enough time and given someone enough help, uh, the best thing is to admit you've made a mistake and move on. Um, slightly different uh, vein back to more of a branding question. Um, in in uh, five years, where will the celebrity brand be? Um, and within the Royal Caribbean portfolio, will it have evolved at all or will it be still in the same positioning space that it is now? Well, from a brand positioning perspective, it will still be in the same space. I think for the past five years with the introduction of these edge uh, series of ships, we've really catapulted the brand into a, a much better position within the marketplace, uh, not even just within the corporate portfolio. All of the metrics for the brand um, that are important to our company and our shareholders have dramatically improved, uh, not only with the edge series, but also with the rest of the fleet. We've renovated the rest of the fleet I think the next, I want to say probably three years is really going to be all about getting back to financial health after this terrible time that we've been in. We just introduced Celebrity Beyond. We have two more ships in this series that we're going to introduce between now and 2025. And I think over the next 12 to 18 months, we're going to have to think about, you know, what's the next series of ships um, and how do we how do we design and introduce yet another series of ships that's going to just continue to exponentially improve the positioning of the brand financially and also in the marketplace with the consumer and further solidify our brand positioning um, and um, and this really unique space that we that we hold within our industry. How do you choose the shipyard that builds your ship? Well, you know, there aren't very many shipyards that build ships. I, I, I want to say first and foremost, there's one in Germany, one in Turku, one in France, and one in Italy. Those are the four major shipyards, all based in Europe. Um, and there are a lot of factors that go in. Who has the space? You know, the yards order books are quite full. Um, the financing is also um, something that we look at, and also the reputation of the yard and the quality of the work that they do is also really important. 
Celebrity built the solstice class in Germany and they did a wonderful job. The Meyer, uh, Meyer shipyard uh, in Poppenberg, they did a wonderful job. We happened to choose the French shipyard for our edge series and they've done an amazing job with these ships. Um, they're as proud of these ships as we are. And so they've, they've been a great partner. And our company is still building ships uh, actually in all of the yards. Our, our company is, is, um, mm -hmm. uh, is, is in all of the shipyards in Europe. Uh, just to clarify, I think you said Turku in Finland, right? Uh, so yes. that's the fourth. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. yes. Uh, Turku in Finland and then Poppenberg, Germany, San Nazaire, France, and Fincantieri, Italy. Uh, what is your view of the uh, China and Asia market, um, which is a, a sort of highly health sensitive market uh, and a young cruising uh, market? Will that come back in the same way as the uh, uh, European and North American markets uh, are coming back, or will there be a time lag there? Well, time will tell. I think there already is a time lag. I think all the other parts of the world, cruising has opened up and China still has not um, for a lot of different reasons. And uh, I celebrity doesn't really operate in China, but Royal Caribbean does uh, and did in a very big way. And so I, I think that... Um, it, time will tell when that market is going to come back. And um, we're hoping that it's in the not too distant future, maybe 12 months or so, but like we really don't have any indication yet. Um, we're, ju we're just gonna wait and see. And in the meantime, Royal Caribbean has redeployed the ships that were originally scheduled to sail in China. Uh, final question, um, any particular leadership role models that uh, uh, have impressed you or influenced you over the over the decades of your career? Um, I I think about um, I you know I I have to say I've worked um, with a lot of great leaders um, that I've had the fortune of working for. I've seen a lot of leaders that have not. Um, probably been people that I would choose to emulate. But I would say that, you know, Richard, our chairman who just uh, stepped down was probably for me, at least in my career and the one I was able to see up close and personal. Sometimes you look at different leaders or leaders of different companies from afar and think, okay, aren't, aren't they wonderful? But it's really the people that you work day in and day out that, that you, um, that you look to and toward. Now, mind you, he's the same guy that I had to ask three times for my position before he finally gave it to me. But he was also a person who um, not only championed me, uh, which I truly appreciate, but also represented for me the things that I think are so important in leadership. Integrity, statesmanship, um, patience, intelligence, creativity, innovation, striving for perfection. Um, you know, he taught, he, you know, I, I, I have this tendency anyway, but he probably taught me more than anyone that, you know, you just, you just keep working an idea until you've made it the best you possibly can and you never settle for anything less than that. And um, so I, I would say that Richard is, is, would probably be the person that I'd have to, I'd have to say. All right, super. Well, uh, we, we, of course, know Richard well and uh, admire him and thank him for uh, uh, his service as chair of the University of Miami Board of Trustees, among many other civic uh, commitments and uh, volunteer positions in the community. Um, so, Lisa, I want to thank you so much for being with us for the hour and uh, for all you've done, uh, not only for the cruise industry, but also championing uh, uh, women in business and being such a fabulous example to our women students, uh, not only on the webinar, but all of our Miami Herbert students as well. So appreciate uh, very much you being with us and sharing the hour. Thank you, Dean. It's been an absolute pleasure. Hope to see you in person soon. Indeed. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Bye, everyone. And a very good evening from Miami. Thank you.